What do we think about this? Matt? Hmm. So I kind of got some input, you know. So uh, maybe... <laughs> what? No, we can't... Well, I mean, I have my guess. <laughs> Don't we say my original or my revised? Let's go... Well, uh, right, revised. If you change your mind, like, then change super close. Okay, revised. Okay, so maybe... I was thinking maybe because, you know, some bonds require heat. The CO2 needs less heat than what's usually outside to be able to go connect to a gas, to a... So not about thought, like Matt's making a connection here of phase of matter and temperature, right? That there's definitely a link between those two things, right? Because can water be a gas? Yes. Could CO2 be a liquid? Yes. Yeah, right, if it changes. Now one thing with temperature, that's not totally the reason, but you're getting there, that I want you all to recognize if you don't know this already, the definition of temperature is it measures the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So temperature literally is measuring how fast or slow they are moving. It actually has nothing to do with heat per se. Okay? Yes. Yep, so heat is a totally different measurement we'll learn about another unit called enthalpy. So enthalpy measures heat. But temperature is the kinetic energy of the molecule, so their movement, right? That's why, so what does water typically boil at in degrees Celsius? A hundred, right? But depending on where you are at in the world, that actually can change because it's not just about heat, right? As soon as my vacuum chamber shows up that I've ordered, you can boil water in this room. Like, and I could put my hand in the boiling water and not get burned. Wait, I got lost. Okay, I'll show you. It'll make more sense when I do it. But once again, what I want you to disconnect if you haven't yet in science, everybody, is don't think of temperature as heat. Think of temperature as the movement of the particles. Okay, Evan, did you have your hand up for another idea? I saw a hand somewhere over here. Oh, I did, but it's not. Oh, Brayden did. I thought it was something. Okay, everyone listen to Brayden, please. With like CO2, is like not polar, but water is polar. Ooh. Like so we kind of looked at like, okay, they're, if they're different, there must be a difference somewhere, right? And so he's saying, well, one's polar, one's not polar, so maybe that has something to do with it. Good hypothesis. Oh, Matt, have a smiley face for sharing, by the way, and Brain as well. Yeah, let's that. True. Could be something about their masses. Now, their masses aren't, I guess it's pretty different, because carbon dioxide is like 44 and water is like 18. But at the same time, is that almost backwards that something with a heavier mass would be a gas? Does that seem backwards? Maybe. But maybe it has something to do with it. Good. Have a smiley face. Other ideas? Ben? Um, because it takes more energy to change form like for water than for carbon dioxide. Good. So there's another key thing as we're visualizing these molecules, right, that if something is a gas, right, if you look at all your gas pictures, I kind of walked around and they seem like they're all idea. Things as a gas should be very spread out from each other. Right? Like, gases, it's crazy how much empty space is actually in this room. Like, air, to us, appears up it's everywhere. Right? Like, I can walk around this room. I can breathe here. I can breathe over here. But, like, I hit a spot and I can pocket of, like, no air. Right? <laughs> yeah, that would be a really bad thing. Um, but gases have a very unique property, everybody, of filling the space they occupy. But we could literally suck all the air in this room and put it in a very small box. They don't actually need that much space, but gases take up that much space. So there's a key component of energy and distance when you're talking about different things. So everyone take a look at your liquid picture. Okay. What's the difference between a liquid and a solid at the molecular level picture? Jordan? Solids are like more compact where there's no room Good. So I like that word she said, now her hands work. Liquids are very free-flowing, right? The reason why I can jump into a swimming pool and go into the water is because, so these are water molecules, you can push them apart, right? They're not strongly linked together. Now, there is some sort of connection, and that's the lesson of today. That's why if you hit water the wrong way, it's all been there, right? <laughs> and at certain heights, I mean, they've measured it like on Mythbusters. It can be the force of like concrete. I know. Did you put like a mattress? Yeah, like water can be really hard. 
Because when things are liquid, there is a type of force happening. Wait, what was the height? I don't remember. Because something like you would jump for like eight hundred feet or something and survive. Well, so that's a trick. There's a of how you hit it, right? Can make a big difference. I mean, but that is literally why, like, Powell, they don't just do it because it's like to crush your fun. Like, it's illegal to jump off of certain heights. It's because they're trying to keep you from dying. <laughs> right? Like, you can literally die if you hit the water the wrong way. I jumped off the street. I'm scary. Yeah, that is kind of scary. I mean, I had a friend who got a black eye from water. Like, water is not She was wakeboarding and crashed. Oh, yeah. yeah, but still, I mean, it's just water, right? Like, it seems like it should be pretty soft. Now, with this idea of solids, everybody, so do solids still move? When water is a solid, are these particles still moving? Yeah, we call it more of a vibration than like a translation. So translational movement would be like this, right? That's how water moves translationally, right? In solids, they're stuck, but they are still vibrating, right? They're not totally stop moving. The point at which molecules completely stop moving is known as absolute zero, and that can only be attained like in a lab scenario. Right? It's not like there's no place on Earth that is at that temperature. Now, with this idea of solids, liquids, and gases, okay, what we're going to be talking about today primarily is this force that can exist between them. Why does it hurt when we belly flop? Um, at some times, but not other times. Why can't I jump into the ground? I know it sounds silly, but like I can jump into water. Why can't I jump and go into the ground? Right? So think about these forces and the interactions that they're having. Yeah, Andrew. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to explain what, um, why I thought that carbon dioxide was different. Yeah. But mine was mostly about like condensation. I wrote, because the molecules stick together because they are polar, they become denser and closer together. And that makes them kind of like, that's how like rain happens, is they mm -hmm. stick together and then come down because they're now like denser. Yeah, there, I mean, there's the sticking part is the key thing here that we're talking yeah. about. Is that molecules at times can stick together. When they are a gas, they are not stuck together at all. They're way far apart from each other. They can bounce off each other, right? Because there's probably water in this room. We don't have much humidity in Utah, but we got maybe a little bit, right? So there could be some water in here, and they could bump into each other. But as a gas, they're never connected in any way. Okay. Now, as we talk about solids, we'll start there. Um, two vocabulary words. We can ex solids can exist in two forms. Okay, so we can call them crystalline in structure or amorphous in structure. It's just two different words. So crystalline means a very uniform structure. Amorphous is not orderly, right? It almost would be like a liquid, but they're stuck in that weird shape. So as solids pack together, they can do one of these two things. Okay? Yeah, Sam. Sorry, what was the answer for the question? We're going to answer it in today's lesson. So I just wanted you to think about it, but by the end, you should be able to give me an answer. Okay, now the first three of these boxes should be review, because we've already talked about metallic and ionic bonding before, but let's review it to connect. So in a metallic bond, we know it looks like this. We know that the electrons are shared universally, right? It's like an electron C. So raise your hand. Someone tell me what's a property of metals because of this structure. Andrew? They are very good conductors. Good. Why? Because the electrons move freely, they can pass a current in like one direction and the other direction. Perfect, right? Things conduct when charges can flow. This electron C is very good at flowing charges. Good, Andrew. It's my case. Eli? Um, it has a very high like temperature. Like, it, can, it takes a while, like melting point. Good. Like, Why? Um, because it's all compact and it's all like, really close together. And there's a lot of electrons, so when you move it, it's going to take a while. Yeah, what do I have to pull apart if I wanted to melt a metal? The protons? Yeah, in a sense, these. And this sea of electrons, I mean, those are moving. But that's going to be hard to pull that apart and actually get it to melt. So, good, Eli, I have some ideas for that. Ben? It's very malleable. Good, why? Because the bonds are weak, so they can bend the metal really easily. Good, and I don't know if I'd call the bonds weak, but I, 
it's that mobile idea, it's right? Yeah, that's they're what flexible, I was to say. right? They're so flexible. Yeah, good. Because weak would refer to they could break easily. The, the it's not brittle. Okay, you perfect. Go. No, you're good. Okay, that was my face back. Any other properties of metals? What was the opposite of brittleness? Malleable. Definitely a property of metals. Good. Another property of metals? Why why does it shine? Any thoughts of why it shines? Just because the electrons like create like a seed and like bounce the Yeah, because it can reflect because the shininess is due to the light being reflected. And once again, those charges can reflect the light. Yeah. Um, if that is dissolved in water. Good. So they are not soluble in water. Nor why would that be? Because for something to dissolve, the Mickey Mouse has to be able to latch on and pull it apart. The Mickey Mouse can't latch onto the electrons, and so then it can't even reach the positives to try to pull it apart. Good. Okay, I think that was all the properties I wanted. Okay, next one. Uh, ionics. So we know ionics look like that picture. <coughs> Okay, we know they're held together by electrostatic interactions, so positive and negative things. So same thing, raise your hand, tell me some properties of ionics. Ben. It's brittle. Good. Why? Because when you move it, it like arranges the charges so positive, like are right up above positive. So Perfect. So they push off, shatter. Good. Eli. Uh, it has a very low melting point. Uh, right? Or is it higher? It's actually it's pretty high, high still. Oh, yeah. It, okay, then it was covalent that was cool. There you go. Yeah. So why would ionics have high melting points? Uh, high, uh, because it's more compact. It's not like the sea where you have like, all the flowing electrons. It's all really condensed. It's all really like, charged together. And what has to happen in order for this to melt? You have to pull apart. Yeah, you have to pull apart this positive and negative. And that's a pretty strong magnet. Okay, we'll just press play again and hopefully it continues. Did you okay. film a V6? No, I always film V6. It's normally better the second time, right? <laughs> Okay, good. High melting point. Other properties? Jordan? Uh, soluble in water. Good. They are soluble in water. So how does that work? Well, because um, the hydrogen and oxygen have positive and negative to attach to it. Perfect. Right? Our water's a little magnet. These are little magnets. Pull it apart. Good. How's my base, Jordan? Andrew? They are very conductible in water. Good. So they conduct in water. Why? They conduct in water because the... Um, the molecules of water kind of act like the electron C in like a metal, whereas like they would, like, it flows through the um, ionic substance in, like the electrons in the metal, Good. rather than, um, that's, that's what I was saying. So think of, you're on the right track yeah. with, in order for something to conduct, you have to have mobile things. When a salt is solid, you have positive and negatives, but they aren't mobile. They're not moving. It's because when, the water it when you much. dissolve it, they now can move and now it can conduct. Right? You need that movement to conduct. So, thanks, Andrew. Matt? Do we want to include, like, it's um, a metal and a metal, or not? We'll actually bring that up later, but in terms of properties, not yet. I guess that's, that is kind of the example. It's a metal with a non-metal. Yeah, that works too. Yeah, so I that one. What about as a solid? Do they conduct as a solid? No. no. So not conductive as a solid. Once again, with all these things throughout the year, keep coming back to your chemistry triangle. Right? These are properties we observe with our eyes, we can measure in the lab, but connected down to why not? Why won't this conduct as a solid? No movement. Good job, Macy. Right? Like, if they can't move, it can't conduct. Good, how's my face on AC? Okay, anything else I missed? I actually need to go ahead. Go ahead. Did you punch him? No. Punch him. Punch him. Punch him. Punch him. Punch him. Punch him. Okay, now, next one. So, for COVID, this is now where things get a little new. Covalent substances can exist in two different forms. The one we've talked about primarily are known as molecular solids. 
So make a little sign out here. Molecular means covalent. I want to say, these are the ones we're familiar with that we did in the labs and things. But a molecular solid is one that consists of atoms or molecules that are held together by intermolecular forces. So your picture kind of didn't print as nicely as I was hoping. If you look at that mine, sorry, I got hiccups. Um, what is going on here is these are carbon dioxide molecules. So this right here is a molecule. And this right here is a molecule, and this is a molecule. Between the molecules is what is known as an intermolecular force. But it is not a bond. That's a big difference here. Ionic, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, that's all bonding in every direction. With molecular solids, this is a bond, but between them is not. Okay, silly analogy, and I think I've mentioned it kind of before, but like an intermolecular attraction, can I see your arm? Can I see your arm? Okay, is like the attractive force, so if he's water, he's water, that force. Okay? Force. That's pretty sick. The actual covalent bond is his arm to himself. <laughs> right? So what's the stronger force? I don't know, let's find out. <laughs> Strong test. <laughs> Okay, so like there's a big difference, right, between the forces here and here. Okay, now let's go to properties of molecular solids. What are some properties they have? Low mass. Oh, there's my blank mark. Low mass. Sometimes soluble in water. Some are, some aren't. So what does that mean if they're sometimes soluble in water? Like, why would sometimes they dissolve and maybe sometimes they won't? Any thoughts on that? Good, right? Some have charges, so they can be pulled apart, but some don't. Good, yeah, that's my thing that. Let me see. Wait, so because there's, like, two forms of the molecular solid and stuff like that way, it's so, like, um, like, like, inconclusive with, like, the sometimes and stuff? A little bit. A little bit that has something to do with it. Yeah. It's because there's lots of different ways the same type of bond can exist. Eli? Could it, it has a low melting point. Good. So these ones are typically lower on the melting point scale. Why would their melting point be lower in comparison? Because um, it pulls apart. The heat supposed to pull everything apart. And with everything being uh, intermolecularly bonded, it's easier to like, pull it apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not breaking the bond when I melt water. I'm breaking just the intermolecular force. It's still a force. It's still energy. But in comparison to Hunter's arm to himself, it's not the same. Right? Good. Have a smile face about you then. Other properties of covalence? It's, let's see. It's sometimes conductive in water. Yeah, and that's what we're going to find. And it's also sometimes conductive as a solid, but sometimes not. The covalents are normally the, it could be, could not be. Once again, because we're going to find it goes down a lot to these intermolecular forces and what type of forces it has present. So, can't either. Could it be brittle? Could be. Yep, so same thing. Sometimes they're malleable, sometimes they're brittle. <laughs> if you were to break it into ones with charges and ones without charges, would like, the ones with charges all be the same, and the ones without charges all be the same? Like, are there two different groups, or are they just still, like... How do they classify? Like, like is there another way to classify them instead of saying they're all over and like, it's one polar and one's not polar, and then all like the same? So, that's a great question with properties, and maybe we'll have to build that as we go. So, what we are going to find is, yes, there's a further classification for molecular than just saying molecular, because molecular, in a sense, can be very broad. In terms of properties, I don't know what properties off the top of my head that we could group. But as we get to those, so there's three classifications of a molecular. Let's think more about their properties and see if they can be grouped. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, Hunter. So does any of that sometimes have to do with like, the resonance? Because you know, we talked about it, like sometimes it conducts when it resonates. Yes, yeah, because sometimes resonating things can allow it to be conductive, but if something doesn't resonate, yeah, good connection. Okay, our second type of covalence, and most of the covalent things are molecular solids. But there are a few species of covalent substances that form what is known as a covalent network. What, is it, what does the word 
network mean? Like social networks, like what's that word mean? Connected, right? So these are so cool and you could like spend so much time looking at pictures and things if you want. Once again, it's still covalent, so they're still sharing. The difference though is, is a covalent network is an extensive array of bonding. So rather being an isolated molecule like this one up here, like dopamine, okay, it is a very extensive array of bonds. So for example, diamond. Diamond is a covalent network. The way, and that's what this picture here is kind of showing, or one form of diamond. In a sense, the way diamonds are structured, okay, is you have, you got to visualize with me because I don't have enough pieces here to show you. Okay, but you have a tetrahedral molecule connected to another tetrahedral, to another tetrahedral, to another tetrahedral, to another tetrahedral, which is another, and it's all connected. How hard is diamond? It's pretty hard. It's the hardest thing. Do you know how to cut diamonds? With diamonds. With diamonds. With diamonds. Yeah, diamonds is one of the hardest known substances on earth. Yeah, how do you get the first diamonds to cut the diamonds? Just when someone asked me last period, I was like, oh, it's like the chicken and the egg question. It was a raw diamond. It was just a telling out what they wanted. I don't know on that. I don't know if it's 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 on that. The first, like, nine diamond. A diamond. They got a diamond. How do you get the first one? Yeah, how do you get the first one? So, does everyone... Based on that picture, though, does everyone understand how, like, why it's so hard? Wait, why is graphite that hard? So now, here's another. So what's carbon? Sorry, I just said it. So diamonds are made of 100% pure carbon. They could have impurities inside of them because, you know, it's not perfect. But it's normally just pure carbon. carbon. Now, graphite, can I see your pencil? This stuff. So this is graphite. We call it lead because once upon a time it used to be lead. But it's but then people found out it's poisonous, so we shouldn't write with it. Um, so now it's actually graphite, but just by default, we still kind of call it lead. So lead is also 100% carbon. So graphite, the thing in your pencil, at the elemental level, is the same thing as what's in a diamond. So the way graphite is built or structured, everybody, this is really cool. I'm just gonna I should grab the second kit so I can build bigger ones for you. You can almost visualize it, okay? This right here is a picture of graphite. So graphite is structured where the carbons are in this circular sheet and then they're connected to each other. But it's a flat sheet. Yeah, that's like, Okay? So what happens is when you take your pencil and you draw a line on your paper, what's happening is those sheets of graphite are laying down on the paper. Whoa. And that's how pencils in a sense write. Because the in between force is this a bond? No. That's an intermolecular force. That's why it only takes the pressure of your hand to get it a cone apart. How strong do you think graphite is, though, as a single layer? It's really strong, right? But as the layers, they can come off one another. Because you're just snapping the layers, right? But if you could, like, to get down to this sheet, that's actually a very strong thing. Yeah, Hunter, then you like so if you apply if you apply enough pressure to graphite, you can turn it into diamonds. Now the cost of doing so is more expensive than mining diamonds. Uh, but there's actually you can look it up over the weekend if you're bored. But I can't remember where it was. There was a lab that one time used their equipment because anything with carbon scientifically can become diamonds, right? So they turned a peanut butter sandwich into diamonds. Bro, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, obviously there's stuff yeah. that wasn't used, right? All the other things. But in a sense, I know someone last person was like, wait, can I turn a human into a diamond then? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, so if you don't want to be cremated after you die, you can like... I need to know by Friday. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, So is that why it's like in some type of levels, like right by the rest, you really can do the rate? Is that the, so is it the way that it's in the bottom? Yes. Is it the way in like a self riddle? Yep. Yep. And that's kind of the key thing here to recognize, everybody. Properties of substances, brittleness, melting point, solubility, conductivity, they all come back to the structure. The structure of things explains why things are the way they are, and it's pretty cool when you start getting down deep to it. So kind of some properties about covalent networks you could write over there. Um, one is they are brittle, but they're also very, very hard. Because diamond is brittle. Diamonds can shatter if you have enough force, but they're definitely not malleable, right? Diamonds are not bendable. They shatter. Um, oh, say what? I don't think so, because in order to write, you'd have to get the pieces to come off, right? So, <laughs> interesting though how they're so similar, right? Sort of, they both have a lot of In general, yeah, because graphite would be fairly low because you're just pulling apart the sheets of graphite, right? But diamond, to melt diamond is like theoretically almost impossible on Earth, right? We don't have anything hot enough that can do that. Yes, because it's hard enough, and so if you use that hard to slide force with it, like you have to use force still to get there. But there is, yeah, there's a, a there's a substance that's harder than a diamond, and then there's others that are also really close to it. What is the hardest thing? I can't remember what it is. I was reading about it actually just yesterday. I don't want to miss it. If it comes to me, I'll tell you. Oh, sorry. I didn't hear that. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about now, everybody, are these forces that exist between molecular solids. So first off, recognize these IMFs, that's abbreviations. When I use the term IMF, that's an intermolecular force. Intermolecular forces are only present in molecular solids. Ionics are just ionically bonded. Covalents are just covalently bonded. I mean, back up. Metallics are just metallically bonded. Oh, yeah. But covalents are covalently bonded, but then they can feel a force of attraction to the other covalent molecules, like water to itself. Okay. The key thing is, though, is it actually still comes back to columbic. What does it mean whenever we use this word columbic? Yep, positives and negatives. It's still a magnetic force. It's not as strong as, like, an ionic magnetic force. It's still magnetic, though. So think about little magnets as we visualize these forces. Okay? Okay, so the first force is known as a dipole-dipole force. Now, let's start with just a single part of the word. What does it mean when a molecule has a dipole moment? It means it's polar. It means it's polar. Expand that, Andrew. It's what does it mean when something's polar? Um, it means that um, it has a positive and negative kind of side to the Good. molecule. Good. And what causes it to have a positive and negative side? The electronegativity of each element. Good. So the electrons in the molecule are being drawn permanently to one side resulting in a negative end and a positive end. There's your magnet, everybody. Okay? So, when a molecule is polar, it can draw the electrons and become, so let's pretend that my yellow one is the negative side and the white is the positive side. It can feel a force of attraction to another one of its kind. Because, same thing, one's positive and one's negative. Now, once again, notice, is this a real bond? No. No. It's just a magnetic force. This is the bond. That's hard to break. Okay, so when we use the word dipole, dipole, it's something polar, something else that's polar, and, oh, there's a force of attraction between them. Now, the stronger the dipole moment, the stronger this magnet becomes. So let's look at some data that shows that. Okay? So here's some five different molecules, all about the same in size, 
But notice that our last one down here has a dipole moment of 3.9. So this is a force at which the electrons are being pulled in the tug of war. As a result, so let's get rid of that box there. What is the boiling point? Oh, this other box popped up. So this one has the highest dipole moment, and it also has the highest boiling point. Make a connection between the forces and the properties. The stronger the force, the more energy it's going to take to pull it apart. Okay? Yeah, Eli? So weight doesn't matter about that. Not for dipoles, no. In other properties, it does. But for dipoles, it's not so much about the mass as it is about the tug of those electrons. Okay? Okay, second force. So that's our first one, is a dipole-dipole. Second one is known as a London dispersion or simply a dispersion force. A dispersion force, so I tried to relate them all to each other so there's a common theme. A dispersion force is a temporary dipole. So what does it mean again if something has a dipole? It's a transfer. Good. The electrons are going to one side. In dispersion, it's only temporary though, meaning the electrons can go one way, but then they can also go back. The way that this works is imagine this. Pretend you're all electrons and we're an atom. Maybe I should have you do this. Some of you guys look tired. Was it like Halloween yesterday or something? Yeah. Okay, so imagine everybody, every stand up. I won't make you run, but just stand up. Some of you look like you want to laugh. Okay, so just pretend, okay, that we just start running around the room like electrons, okay? And then I say pause. If we're just running around like electrons do, and we pause at a given moment, is there a chance that more of you could be on this side of the room than on that side of the room? Yes. Yes. Is that a probability? Yes. So if there's more electrons over here, what happens to this charge? Good. So we get this temporary negative and temporary positive. But why is it only temporary? Because Yeah, because you're always moving, and so it could go back. Now, they can influence each other's temporary dipole, though, right? So imagine we're all electrons. The students on the other side of that wall are electrons. Oh. If we all ran to the back of the room, what's going to happen to They're them? They're going to be like, boom. They're going to bounce. Because we're going to, like, shift and we're going to fall. They're going to, like, get pushed as well, right? So you can kind of cause domino effect of temporary shifts because of it. Yeah, Matt? Um, so you can all sit down now. So tell me that, Matt. So what types of substances could have this? Metals. Oh, no. Metals are the always moving yeah, thing, right? Um, or tell me this. What's the requirement here? What do we only need to make this happen? So all molecules, all covalent substances do this. Even ones that have a permanent dipole can also get a little bit stronger at times through this temporary dipole. So everything in the world experiences this. That's why everything in the world can eventually become a liquid if you get it cold enough. Yeah? So, like, but this, but this um, temporary um, stuff is just, like, so weak that it... Is it like a, it's a pretty weak force, right? Yes, obviously, so yeah. So it's not going to hold them super strongly, right? Because they can break. Yeah. So this is why. Look at the halogen family, everybody. The halogen family is kind of cool um, in that two of them are gases at room temperature. So fluorine and chlorine are gases. Bromine is a liquid, and iodine is a gas. I mean, a solid, sorry. All four of those are diatomic. So they exist as F2, Cl2, Br2, I2. There you are, Hoffman. As a diatomic molecule, are any of these molecules polar? No. No. Right? None of them are polar because it's a tug of war with itself. But because iodine is so massive and has so many electrons to shift, its London dispersion force is strong enough that it makes it a solid at room temperature. But fluorine is so small and doesn't have very many electrons to do the temporary shift. And so that's why it's a gas at room temperature. So in this one, opposite, I think Eli, you were the one who said it, mass has a big effect on the strength of force. 
the heavier things have stronger dispersion forces than the lighter things do. Because there's more electrons to run around the room. With the graph you had earlier, it was, kind of, it was still, I was going to go with that like, theory. Because you had like the one with the highest melting point, if you like, that 40 point, uh -huh. it was the lowest in. It was like at 40, and the rest were a little bit higher, and they have lower Good, so with the dipole-dipole force, the mass doesn't make it shift stronger or not. So in that case, it was more just about the dipole moment than it is about the mass. Um, so, good connection. But for weight, so weight matters in this, but weight doesn't matter. If like yeah, so if you're looking at dipole force strength, make weight doesn't really matter. Now, another factor that affects this a lot is the shape. So two things with dispersion force are mass and shape. The more surface area a molecule has, the stronger the dispersion force will be. Why would that be? If you have more surface area, why would that help, Andrew? Um, so back to our classroom analogy, it would be like we have a bigger room. Yeah. And so if we're all running around in kind of random directions, there's a, um, there's a higher like maximum distance of students from on one side versus the other. Yeah, and you think of their magnets, right? If you have a bigger spaced magnet, it can influence other magnets even more, right, versus something that's more compact. So these two substances, n-pentane and neopentane, have the exact same mass. But this one has a lower boiling point because the way it's structured is a tighter structure, so there's less surface area to interact. So really big long chains, so like the substances that are we call them chains of molecules like this. So those are all hydrogens on the outside. Those we would say have a very big surface area, and so they're gonna have stronger dispersion forces versus something like just this. So this is methane, and methane is a gas at room temperature. This is butane. Right, which is a liquid at room temperature. Same force, but the greater the surface area also can affect it as well. Yeah, Alyssa, the north. Is it because the electrons on the one with the small and surface area, they can be in the middle, and then they don't affect other yeah. molecules as much because they're in the middle, so they don't have as much force. But that one, there's not as much middle to be in, so they're more likely to be on the outside edge. No, definitely. Yeah, great connection. No. So when um, there's different altitudes, does the, is the surface area like the altitude affected by it so that it has a higher elevation? Ooh, great question. No, so actually elevation does not affect these forces. What elevation affects is the outside force. So what happens, right, is pressure, like, so you know, like, when you go up in elevation, the pressure around you decreases. And so since there's less pushing down, it's easier for the molecules to escape out. But the forces actually don't change. So if you took the same two things to the same elevation, they would both change in the same retrospect. That's why for those that don't know, like to boil water on top of Mount Everest, water boils at like 73 degrees. Because there's less pressure pushing down on the water, and so it doesn't take as much energy for the water to break. But compared to like sea level, or if you go like to places that are actually below sea level, it takes more than 100 degrees to boil there. Wow. So, yeah, great question. Okay, ready for the third one? So we have dispersion, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. Okay? Hydrogen bonding is an extreme version of dipole-dipole. So once again, they're all this positive and negative idea. The reason why it's so extreme is for a few reasons here. Let me say those in and look over here at my picture. So with water, so here's our little water molecule, everybody. Is water a polar molecule? Yes. Yes. So water has dipole-dipole forces. Would water have London forces or dispersion forces? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right? So keep in mind, these forces can overlap. They can have both. 
Water, though, also has a force known as a hydrogen bond. Now, who wins the tug of war between oxygen and hydrogen? Oxygen. Oxygen. Okay. So oxygen is pulling the electron away and becoming very negative because its electronegativity is one of the highest. So it's still partial, but it's stronger than most of the other elements. How many electrons does hydrogen have? One. If you pull away the only electron hydrogen has, what do you leave behind? Only positive. So it's not ionic. It's not taking the electron. But what happens here is rather than just being positive, it becomes almost like super positive. Oh, yeah. That's because you're leaving behind a proton, and that's it. This super positive can then be attracted to the negative of the oxygen, and this right here is your hydrogen bond. Oh. Okay? Now, here's the confusing part that I don't love. It's not a real bond. We call them hydrogen bonds, but it's not a real bond. It's just a force of attraction. My guess is we use the word hydrogen bond just because it is quite strong in comparison. But once again, this right here, that's a hydrogen bond force. That is the actual covalent bond. Okay, now this is why it hurts when you belly flop. Because water is playing like a game of tug of war, not tug of war, uh, Red Rover against you. <laughs> right, so the waters are all like grabbing onto each other as you approach. He's coming, he's coming, yeah. And if you hit it like this, you're smacking right on their red rover game. Okay, so they're gonna be like in a sense. In a sense, yeah. right? Like it's 3D, but on the surface, yeah. So now, what happens if you jump in and go straight? Yeah, you can break the red rover game and not feel that force, right? Yeah, Eli. So I'm um, just kind of confused looking at the uh, drawings up there. Why this hydrogen? So does the hydrogen bond with the three red dots, is that a term for the hydrogen? Yes, so if you want to label that. So these are all examples of hydrogen bonding. So hydrogen only happens with NOF, N O or F. The reason is because they have the highest electronegativities that allow it to happen. Okay, so in these pictures up here, all of the red dotted lines, that's the hydrogen bond. So the requirement for a hydrogen bond is you have to have a hydrogen directly bonded to N, O, or F. You then have to have N, O, or F on the other side as well. So you have to have a NOF sandwich. N, O, H, I mean N, O, or F, hydrogen, N, O, or F. The hydrogen bond is that strong force between the two molecules. Can that work vertically as well? Yeah, yeah, totally. So you could have another one like that way. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yep, totally. Either. So it can't it's just be hydrogen, right? So like, can, is it only hydrogen or can it be like lithium or sodium? It's actually only hydrogen because of that one electron. Because by pulling that one electron away, that's what causes the super positive to happen. Yeah, but we'll pull it to other the lithium has three electrons, so yeah, but good question. Okay, any other questions on hydrogen bonds? Okay, here's our summary of all three forces, and then we'll do a little demo to put it together. I'm gonna grab one last thing where you fill in this sentence. You've got about six minutes. Okay. Hey, hey. I wouldn't see why this is Okay, now as we look at these three forces, what you're going to do on one of your homework assignments is identify the forces that are present. So the column that will help you here is this one. So in order for something to have a dipole force, it has to be polar. So if you still don't know how to tell if something is polar or not from our last unit, we need to learn that skill. Okay? Everything has London forces, so that's an easy one, because everything, everything that's covalent has it. 
Hydrogen has to have hydrogen with not and or at. And it has to be directly bonded to it. Okay? Yeah? What does it say on the top right? Yeah. It kind of is like blocked off a little bit from mine. Oh, it gets stronger the molecules are closer. So the closer the magnets can get, the stronger that dipole force can interact. Thank you. Yeah, that is, it lands right on that part. It's hidden. Okay, let's talk about strength. Which one would be the strongest of these three forces? Yeah, so this is our strongest. Which one would be our weakest? London. Our London, and then dipoles in the middle. Now, there is a small overlap region. We'll look at this strength chart right here. So you can see that at times, some really big molecules can have stronger dispersion forces than some dipoles do. Okay? Now, you're never going to have to memorize that. But given data, you should be able to notice, like, oh, well, this one only has dispersion, and it has a higher boiling point, so that must mean that its dispersion are actually stronger than this other one's dipole. Hydrogen is always strong up top. We'll learn about this one later on in the unit. These two, everybody, are the true bonds. Now, the scale is really not balanced. If you look at the numbers, <laughs> look at the numbers here, ready? So it goes 0 to 2, that's to 5, that's to 10, 20, that's 100. 400. 1,000. <laughs> okay? So don't be deceived by the scale. So that should be like so how much stronger are these? A lot. A lot. Right? To break the actual covalent bonds, to break ionic bonds, is a lot more than breaking these intermolecular forces. Okay? Okay. Here's an example of what one of your homework assignments is going to look like tonight. Given a substance, you should be able to identify the forces present. So I'm going to do two examples with you. And then I'll let you try the others for some smiley faces. Okay? So looking at NH3, the first question you want to ask is, is it ionic, covalent, or metallic? So how do I answer that question? Good. The types of elements that are bonding. So our combination SAMR, if it's a metal with the metal, then it's metallic. If it's a metal with a non-metal, Oh yeah, that's ionic. And then what's our last one? Non-metal, non-metal. Non-metal and non-metal, that's... Covalent. 